Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined by my good friend Jennifer Avery to discuss part five of our ongoing seminar series on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Jennifer, why don't you take it away? What do you want to talk about today? Oh, first, before we do that, I want you to tell everybody what you do and how they can get in touch with you. Okay, well, uh, I'm a content editor, uh, as, as I've mentioned before, and uh, I, uh, I edit for continuity as well as grammar and for uh, sentence structure and flow. And if you would like to uh, talk to me about uh, my editing the 20, first 20 pages as a sample, uh, my uh, email address is javerysce at gmail.com. And that is javerysce at gmail.com. And I'm also happy to uh, do tutor, and gram uh, to tutor grammar and uh, literature and creative writing. Fantastic, fantastic. So what are we going to be talking about today? Okay, well, we are on Chapter 12 of Pride and Prejudice, and uh, poor Lizzie and poor Jane are still at Netherfield. And uh, but this but they're almost done. Jane is almost well, and so uh, they so they decide one. They kind of have a conversation with each other one morning and say, "Hey, well, uh, let's send a note home and see if um, Mom will let us come home." And uh, they get a note back from Mrs. Bennett, and she's like, "No, you can't leave yet. You need to be there for a whole week. So I'm not going to send the carriage for you until Tuesday." Well, this is just not going to work for the sisters because Lizzie is really tired of having to spend so much time with Mr. Darcy and Miss Bingley and uh, Mr. Hurst and all these people that she does, doesn't really like that much. And uh, they pretty much decided that if they stayed any longer, then it would seem rude anyway. And so they, fin and so they finally decide to talk to Mr. Bingley about loaning them his carriage so they can go home and so that's what they decide to do and Mr. Bingley understands but that but his sisters kind of urge them to stay one more day uh, with, and uh, and so they so they kind of begrudgingly say okay well we'll stay one more day uh, just to make sure Jane's well and uh, that's what they do and uh, and from uh, in the text um, the only person who's really sorry for this is Mr. Bingley because he really does like Jane and he hates to see her go and he's really enjoyed having her there. But everybody else is kind of happy about this. Miss Bingley does not like Lizzie at all because she knows that Mr. Darcy has been watching Lizzie with a particular interest. Mr. Darcy is really ready for Lizzie to go because he uh, because he's really beginning to like her and he knows that if he starts to like her uh, that they that nothing would ever come of it because of the difference in their in their social standing and the difference in their estates and the money and all of that uh, and so um, and so Mr. Darcy's happy to see them go and so finally they do kind of head home and uh, like this one little bit right here that I want to read uh, about Mr. Darcy, and you really, be, really see, like this kind of plants the seed for what happens later on in the book when Mr. Darcy and Bennett and, and uh, Elizabeth get together again later on. Um, to Mr. Darcy, it was welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Netherfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her and more teasing than usual to himself. He wisely resolved to, partic to, to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him. Nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity. Sensible that, if such an idea had been suggested, his behavior during the last day must have have material weight in confirming or crushing it. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday. So basically, he knows the way that he acts the last day that she's there is going to leave a stamp in her mind and other people's minds about how he feels about her. And so he's very careful to not pay her any attention 
for the whole last day, and that's exactly what he does. And so finally, uh, after they go to church, um, which is, this is on a Sunday, they uh, Elizabeth and Jane head home. And when they get home, Mrs. Bennett's not happy to see them. Mrs. Bennett wanted them to stay longer, and she kind of gets on to them for using Mr. Bingley's carriage. Oh, what will he think of us? And so they, and, uh, and pretty much all, and Mr. Bennett, bless his heart, he says that, uh, he says that the evening conversation when they were all assembled had lost much of its animation and almost all of its sense by the absence of Jane Elizabeth, is <laughs> how Mr. Bennett sees it. Uh, and uh, then they, and uh, basically uh, Mary's, sitting there studying and Lydia and Kitty are talking about officers as they usually do and that's the end of chapter 12. <laughs> um, and chapter 13. Now here comes a new character. Uh, Mr. Bennett uh, says to Mrs. Bennett, uh, well I hope you have a good dinner prepared because we're going to have a guest. Immediately, Mrs. Bennett says, "Oh, Mr. Bingley's going to come and have dinner with us." And Mr. Bennett sa immediately says, "No, it's not Mr. Bennett. It's not Mr. Bingley. It's somebody I've never met." And the person that he's talking about is Mr. Collins. Now, Mr. Collins is Mr. Bennett's nephew. It's his brother's son. And Mr. Bennett and his brother did not get along well with each other. But because Mr. Bennett did not have any sons, his estate is entailed away to the nearest male relation who is Mr. Collins. And so now the guy who's going to inherit, inherit Longbourn, the house where all the Bennetts live, uh, he is coming to dinner. Now, Mrs. Bennett is immediately offended by this. She all, she just complains about him for two or three paragraphs, uh, and uh, but she doesn't really. Uh, but because Mrs. Bennett's kind of dim, she doesn't understand that there's nothing that can be done about it, and it's not even Mr. Collins's fault. It's just the way that the terms are written. It's the law. They have to abide by it, and there's nothing they can do about it. So the daughters aren't going to get the house, and as soon as Mr. Bennett's dead, uh, Miss, Mr. Collins will be able to come in and start living at that house, and he can do with the, with the daughters anything he wants to, essentially. But Mr. Bennett reads a letter from Mr. Collins, and this letter is the first indication of the kind of person we're dealing with here. Okay, so first of all, things you need to understand about Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins is not very bright. <laughs> he's not very bright at all. Uh, he's gotten lucky, and he's a uh, he is uh, the uh, the clergyman for a parish uh, that is adjacent to Rosings Park, which is the home of Lady Catherine de Berg. Now, a lady. Lady and Lord, these are very high. So these are very high ranks in that during that time. The House of Lords uh, in the Parliament, they're basically like the Senate, and so uh, and the Lords are all landed gentry, but they have a lot of influence, a lot of pull, and they're from old families. And so ha they have all of these things in their favor. And Lady Catherine is the is the widow of a Lord. Okay. And so, Mr. Collins is, uh, is in charge of the parish near Lady Catherine's home. And uh, all he can talk about is how marvelous Lady Catherine is, how beautiful her house is, how... Um, and a word that he uses a lot is the word condescension. Lady Catherine shows me... Uh, let me see. She, she shows me such condescension. Um, let me find it here. Okay. He had never in his life witnessed such behavior in a person of rank, such affability and condescension. Uh, the word condescension in, modern, in the modern sense uh, is, kind, is a negative. And we kind of see being condescended to as being, a, as being an insult. But in older, in, 
in older texts and the history of English, condescension basically means paying attention to someone lower than yourself. And so Mr. Collins uses it as a positive, even though for the most part, even at this time, in English, it was mostly viewed as a negative thing. He talks about how Lady Catherine shows him such condescension. So that's something you need to understand about that. Uh, but, um, so the letter that he writes is basically saying, oh, well, uh, I'm, I say, the disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honored father always gave me much uneasiness. And since I have had the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. But for some time I was kept back by my own doubts, fearing lest it might seem disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with anyone with whom it had always pleased him to be at variance. My mind, however, is made up on the subject, for having received ordination at Easter, which means he was inducted into the clergy, I have been so fortunate as to be distinguished by the patronage of right of the right honorable Lady Catherine de Berg, widow of Sir Louis de Berg, whose bounty and beneficence has preferred me to the valuable rectory of this parish, where it shall be my earnest endeavor to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship. So the only important thing that he sees about joining the clergy at this point, is that it is uh, uh, is for the par for Lady Catherine's parish, and he and even his desire, he's even he says even his desire to uh, to make peace with Mister Bennett stems from Lady Catherine from ha feeling this importance of being the clergyman for Lady Catherine. And so everything stems from her and his relationship to her. Um, and so he says that he wants to make amends to the daughters of the house because they can't have this house when Mr. Bennett dies. He feels guilty about it, and so he wants to make amends to them. And at this point, nobody knows what that means. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, Mr. Bennett says uh, that they're going to expect him at 4 o'clock that day. And when he arrives, uh, well, actually, after, after he reads the letters, we, she, uh, Austin talks about the different reactions from the different family members. For the, uh, Jane, Jane is a little bit curious as to what he means by making amends to the daughters. Elizabeth can't get over his deference for Lady Catherine and uh, his kind intention of christening, marrying, and burying his parishioners whenever it were required. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth thinks that he's, he must be an oddity. And Elizabeth gathers from just this letter exactly what he is, which gives you a really good insight into how incisive Elizabeth is about characters, about people. Uh, and just from this letter, she's figured him out. Uh, but, of course, he's not really that difficult to figure out. <laughs> but, uh, in any case, uh, she says there's something very pompous in his style. And what can he mean by apologizing for being next in the entail? We cannot suppose he would help it if he could. Can he be a sensible man, sir? And she's looking at her father, and and her and Mr. Bennett says, No, dear, I think not. I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. There is a mixture of servility and self-importance in his letter, which promises well. I'm impatient to see him. And so Mr. Bennett's looking forward to it because he can laugh at this guy. Because he knows he can laugh at this guy at how ridiculous he is. And, and Mr. Bennett, as we know, that's one of his favorite pastimes, is laughing at stupid people. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in any case, um, and uh, Mrs. Bennett is, is by, like, she, like all, after all of her rants about how awful this guy is, and oh, this odious man, don't mention his name, 
uh, Mrs. Ben is like, oh, well, you know, he actually sounds kind of nice, and I do hope that he does make amends to the girls. And she's immediate, she's taken in by this. Whereas Lizzie, Jane, and Mr. Bennett uh, aren't. Uh, but the younger girls just don't care enough. Uh, Mary, well, actually, Mary is impressed by how he expresses himself. Uh, and actually, it's kind of implied that Mary kind of forms a little crush on Mr. Collins. Um, and, but Lizzie and Kitty just don't care because he's not, he's not going to show up in a red coat. He's not an officer, so he's not worth their notice. Um, but in any case, Mr. Collins shows up on time. And uh, the first thing he does is compliment Mrs. Bennett on how well the the house is arranged and how nice the furnishings are and everything like that and um uh, and mrs bennett uh she said uh, th she said this gallantry was not much to the ta oh wait a minute it's the wrong one yeah 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 yeah, yeah. oh what is it oh, i can't find it no, i'm sorry so okay, first of all he said he talks about how he was happy to find that the girls are so pretty as he had heard that the girls are pretty and and um and that they're you know and they're and they're affable or you know uh, engaging young ladies and um and of course uh, mrs bennett's like oh yes of course you know <laughs> and um <laughs> And Mrs. Bennett, and, 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 why, and then he goes about talking about how nice the, the furnishings are and how well it's set up. And Mrs. Bennett's a little bit, you know, look, look, set him a little askance uh, because she, she's thinking, well, he's looking at this like it's his already. Um, and, so, and, and so there's that little, tiny little bit of tension. But as soon as he compliments the girl, she's, she's all nice again. <laughs> but in any case, that's pretty much... Um, the end of chapter 13, uh, they bring him to dinner, uh, they go into dinner is pretty much the last thing, um, and all, uh, he says, uh, hey, when he was, okay, he was, the dinner too, in its turn, was highly admired, remember, he's complimenting everything, uh, was highly admired, and he begged to know to which of his fair cousins the excellence of its cookery was owing. But here he was set right by Mrs. Bennett, who assured him with some asperity that they were very well able to keep a good cook, and that her daughters had nothing to do in the kitchen. He begged pardon for having displeased her. In a softened tone, she declared herself not at all offended, but he continued to apologize for about a quarter of an hour. And so basically all he does is... Mr. Collins, all he does is compliment almost to the point of being, in an obsequious way, in an annoying way. He compliments everything, and, it, and he apologizes for things he shouldn't be apologizing. He's always apologizing for something, and you'll see that throughout his visit. Uh, but that's the end of Chapter 13. And going on to ch uh, chapter fourteen is uh, they've they've had dinner they've had dinner and after dinner Mr. Bennett's been quiet for the most part and now after dinner uh, Mr. Bennett decides to have his fun uh, and Mr. Bennett says Lady Catherine De uh, he he says to Mr. Collins uh, Lady Catherine De Burr's attention to his wishes and consideration for his comfort appeared very remarkable Mr. Bennett could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect, he pro protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behavior in a person of rank, such affability and condescension as he had himself experienced from Lady Catherine. And uh, so, and he goes on and on about how great Lady Catherine is, it's like he's uh, talks about how she how uh, she uh, how, how she approved of all of his uh, of all of his his sermons and she's invited him to dinner. She even asked him to play cards with him one, with her once, and she actually visited visited him at the rectory and and made some suggestions to put 
shelves in the closet. <laughs> so, um, so he goes on and on about this. Um, and then they start asking some questions about if she has any kids, if she has any children. And then he starts talking about uh, Mr. Berg. And he's... Uh, let me see. Okay, he says... Uh, she's... Oh, he says, I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess and that the most elevated rank, instead of giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself peculiarly bound to pay. And so basically, uh, first of all, Mr. Berg and Berg, uh, Lady Catherine's daughter, is sickly. Uh, and she's small, and she's and she gets sick really easily, and she doesn't really go out. She doesn't really do anything. Uh, and so all she does basically is stay home with her mother. Uh, but Mr. Collins says, oh, well, uh, it talks about the compliments that he pays to Anne de Berg. And he actually admits, I conceive myself purely bound to pay these attentions. Like he's purposefully and falsely, almost, praising this lady. And uh, Mr. Bennett notices this. He says, you judge very properly, Mr. Bennett, said Mr. Bennett. And it is happy for you that you possess a talent, the talent of flattering with delicacy. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment or, or, or are the result of previous study? <laughs> so this is one of my favorite, this is one of the funniest lines, in my opinion, in this book. It's because he's basically saying, so basically every compliment you pay comes, does it come from your actual thoughts at the moment or does it come from you forming these compliments yourself when you don't and he said and and mr collins actually admits they arise chiefly from what is passing at the time and though i sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions i always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible so he's admitting to being insincere here and he doesn't even realize it. And that's how important rank is to some people in these books, is that they are willing to basically lie, to shove their noses firmly into the rear of the people that they're trying to please. And that's exactly what Mr. Collins is. He's a sycophant. <laughs> He's a complete and utter sycophant, and uh, and and that's pretty much the whole of his character is the fact that he is a sycophant, and um, and then we find out. Uh, let me see here. Okay, and Mr. Bennett, uh, and so Mr. Bennett is really amused by all of this, everything that that Mr. Collins has been saying, but. After, you know, after they had tea and after they've been sitting together for a little while, Mr. Bennett's had enough. And he goes to his library and, uh, and closes the door <laughs> and has his time to, his, to you know, to, to, to himself. And so the, ladies, uh, so the ladies try to get Mr. Collins to read to them. And uh, Mr. Collins readily assented and a book was produced. But on beholding it, for everything announced it to be from a circulating library, he started back, and begging parted, protested that he never read novels. Uh, so, basically, he, he never reads novels. It's like he's kind of, he won't even touch a book from a circulating library because he's got this elevated idea that he's gotten from Lady Catherine. Um, and... Um, so he finally decides on Fordyce's sermons. And what Fordyce's sermons is, is basically like a book of, of uh, religious sermons directed at women. Uh, and mm. that's basically what this is. And of course, this is something that none of the girls are particularly interested in, especially Kitty and Lydia. And 
the Kitty and Lydia are so rude as to while he's in the middle of reading, they actually start talking about gossip in town in the middle of him reading, which was, was considered extremely rude. Uh, you ask a guy to read, he does it, and then you completely interrupt him. Yeah, that would make me mad, too. Can, can I ask you a question? Of course. Could you elaborate on these sermons that were geared towards women that he was reading from? The, this is an actual text, or I've never I've never heard of this. Can you yeah, it, do you have uh, any background on it? it? I don't know a whole lot about it, but there is a little uh, footnote. Uh, it says uh, sermons to uh, James Fordyce's sermons to young women. Uh, this was written in 1766, and it offered uh, conservative advice on female conduct and education. Uh, and this would have been something that was well known at the time, because a lot of times uh, sermons and lectures were put in book form for people to read at home. And this is one of those that was meant specifically for young ladies, and it says it's conservative, which means basically shut up and do what your husband tells you, uh, and uh, and you know be be ladylike and don't talk too much and you know that is that sort of thing. But that's what it means by conservative advice. And now this is conservative for 1766. So imagine <laughs> uh, what yeah. we're talking about here. I, I have a little information on on okay. it. It's uh, from just from Wikipedia. It's a two volume compendium of sermons. Um, and I guess he was a Scottish clergyman, mm -hmm. uh, known for his oratory skills. Uh, what was interesting, it, it seems like it made it into one other novel. Um, I don't know if you know the book, The Rivals by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Mm -hmm. Apparently his sermon on sobriety was mentioned there. Yeah. So yeah, this would have been a widely known book. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and it was published in, it looks like it was published in 1766. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, cool. All right, yeah, I just found that curious. It's interesting. Yeah, and I was like, a lot of times, like like I said, a lot of times sermons and abstracts were put to, were published in books for people to study at home. And that's what a lot of people, that's actually what people mostly read. Reading I think novels. that's so cool. I think that's so cool. I know you think it's kind of like old fashioned, but like, um, like my mother does like a bunch of stuff with like antiques or whatever, and I I help her with this. And oftentimes, like we'll go we'll go through estate sale stuff, and I'll find like these like incredibly small Bibles or incredibly small versions of the of the New Testament or something like that, or. Or or the U.S. Constitution yeah. or some other thing, and like I just think about how you know how people like hundreds of years ago were walking around with books on them and like to kill time were reading this incredible like six point font print yeah. and educating themselves wherever they could, and instead what we're doing today a lot of the times is taking selfies and I I you know. <laughs> I, I like to think that I use my iPhone in a way that is always like educative because I'm constantly listening to sermons and 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 books and lectures and things like that. But I have a feeling I might be a little bit of an outlier. Uh, <laughs> but but I just thought it was such an interesting relic of history that people carried around books with them everywhere. And it's not like they were this. If you're watching the video version, it's not like they were this big. They were like yeah, you know, one fifth the size of this, and they read them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, many books, especially novels at the time, and, and and these books of sermons and things like that, they were very small for, like you said, for that reason, so that people could carry them around and read them whenever they had, ch you know, whenever they had to wait on something or found themselves somewhere, or you know, but um, but yeah, I mean that's that, and as I, as I was saying, at this time, people mostly read nonfiction. Uh, whereas now we mostly read novels. Back then, people mostly read nonfiction. They read sermons. They read uh, essays. Uh, they read uh, natural histories and things like that. And reading novels was considered something that ladies do. Uh, novels were considered uh, a lower form of entertainment than they are now. Uh, like uneducated people read novels. 
as that sort of thing. And that's why yeah, we Mr. saw that. We didn't we see that in Northanger Abbey? Was it was it that? Yeah. Where um, where the main character is? Is it was the book called what was it Rudolfo or yeah, the mysteries of Udolfo. Yeah. yeah, and 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 she was ridiculed all over the place for for reading that book. Yeah, and I was like, why are you making fun of her for reading? Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, but, and that, but that's why it's like a lot, like like a lot of the other characters in Northanger Abbey give her a hard time for reading novels, and she's yeah. even embarrassed by reading novels because that's the way it was back then. That was considered entertainment for women. It was lower. It was it was less seemly. Uh, and, and, you know, and so... Well, what were men reading? Were they just reading botany textbooks? Like, what, what was a man supposed to do with his, with his intellect? Uh, well, uh, like, a, like in, a, some, in some of Austin's novels, they talk about some natural histories, uh, and again, and there's sermons and lectures, um, and, uh, like uh, histories, like the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, which is a very well known history book, uh, back that was published around in that time, uh, and you know his I, that that sort of thing, histories and natural histories and sermons and le and lectures and essays. That's basically what a man was expected to read, because that was considered expanding your 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 education, whereas novels were considered uh, just idle amusement. Right. And so, yeah, and these days we have a, a, even reading novels is considered an intellectual thing these days. Uh, even reading a bad novel is considered intellectual sometimes. Uh, but, um, but I, it's amazing to think of how things have changed because and after the advent of television and radio. Uh, because you didn't have to read to to hear about what was going on or to understand things, uh, and so uh, I kind of I'm like you. I kind of sometimes wish that we had little tiny volumes to carry around everywhere too. <laughs> well, well, that, that's what we're doing here, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why I have a big purse so I can fit a book in there. <laughs> but, well, what I'm saying is, you know, essentially, I think Noetic is sort of the digitalized version of that yeah. of that same mentality. Yeah. I like to think so too, uh, and, uh, and we do have this great audio book thing that we can do now too, like all apps like Audible and Noetic and and these other apps that we can listen to books. But some like I'm not an, I'm not an audio person. I'm a visual person, so I have to read it, or I'm not going to remember it. Toe the party line, Jennifer. I know. I know. Audio's the future. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't take notes in an audio book or highlight passages. I'm sorry, it's not happening. <laughs> I like my paper books. And I like my little tabs. <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, uh, that's why Mr. Collins kind of turns his nose up at the novel from the circulating library and chooses this book of sermons to read to the girls. Um... But in any case, uh, let me see, uh, okay, Lydia, uh, so, so, so Lydia's interrupted Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins has this, and this is probably, this is the one thing that he says that I'll agree with a little bit. <laughs> I have to, I have often observed how little young ladies are interested by books of a serious stamp. Though written solely for their benefit, it amazes me, I confess, for certainly there can be nothing so advantageous to them as instruction. But I will no longer importune my young cousin. So he quits reading. He's offended, and so he quits reading. And then he goes in to Mr. Mr. Bennett and tries to get him to play backgammon with him. <laughs> and that's pretty much the end of the chapter. Um... But in any case, so Mr. Collins is now well installed in, you know, at Longbourn. He's had dinner with them, and we know a little bit more about him now. And uh, to sum up, he is an obsequious idiot. His almost his entire being is a sycophant. That's pretty much all he is, and as a character. Um, and, and we get confirmation of that at the beginning of chapter 15 
where Jane Austen writes, Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society, the greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father, and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms without forming it at it any useful acquaintance. So that basically means, like, part of going to the university back in those days was to meet people, much like it is even today, it's to network. That, that's our word for it now, is networking. Is All he did was, bar was barely keep his grades up, and he didn't, he didn't do any networking. And we find out that a fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourgh uh, when he when he uh, when, when her living went vacant. And so he didn't even do anything to get this, but he's so proud of having this uh, of, of having this uh, this parish uh, as if he did it himself. Uh, but in any case. Um, and we this little bit here too, and the respect which he felt for her high rank and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his right as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance, and humility. <laughs> so he is humble basically he is proud of how humble he is <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's it seems like an oxymoron but that's what this basically is and I'm sure that we all know people like this I know I've known people like this it's like they are proud of how humble they are <laughs> <laughs> and that's Mr. Collins uh, and this is another reason why this book is so important just to take a minute Pride and Prejudice is considered one of the greatest novels in the English language. And one of the reasons for that is the characters. We all know people like this. We all know a Lizzie. We all know a Mr. Darcy. We all know a Mr. Collins. We all know a Lady Catherine. All of us. And it may, it may be in different, you know, different contexts, maybe uh, different, slight little differences, but we basically know these people. And that's why this is so important, is because the, her characterizations are flawless in this book. Like, she's got every single one of her characters pegged inside and out. And Mr. Collins is a great example of that, I think. Um, but in any case, um, so we, she, when she goes on in, in the narrative that now that he has a good income, now that he's got this house, now that he's got a place, he's looking to get married. And part of the reason why he thinks he needs to get married is because Lady Catherine said he should. Um, and, uh, his plan, and we find out that he had planned on choosing his wife from the Bennett girls. Oh boy, won't they be so excited. And uh, so, we find out that his first object is Jane. Obviously, because she's the oldest, and she's the prettiest, and she's the sweetest. And we know that. But, Mrs. Mrs. Bennett kind of reigns on his parade and says, oh, well, you know, I have to kind of hint that she might be getting engaged soon, so you might not want to think of her. And so, immediately, uh, and it, it says here, um, let me see what this is. Right. Mr. Collins had only to change from Jane to Elizabeth. And it was done. It was soon done. Done while Mrs. Bennett was stirring the fire. <laughs> so essentially, because Lizzie is the second oldest, the second prettiest, and the second sweetest, <laughs> uh, he decides on Lizzie. And bless her heart, because Mrs. Bennett thinks it's a great idea. Um, and so she says that she uh, she. It, it says Mrs. Bennett treasured up the hint, so she's got it in her head already that she's going to have two daughters married, and she's about ready to throw a party already, even though nothing's happened yet. Uh, not and and again, not even thinking about what her daughters want. 
and not even thinking about what an idiot this guy is because she doesn't know he's an idiot because she's an idiot herself. <laughs> but in any case, um, but in any case, uh, so Mr. Collins has decided that he likes, that he's going to like Lydia or Elizabeth. And, uh, after all of this, uh, Lydia and Kitty had had already kind of decided, let's, let's walk into town. And the reason why Lydia and Kitty always want to go into town is because that's where the soldiers are. That's where the officers are. And that's where they get all their attention. And they love gossip, and they get all the gossip they want to from Mrs. Phillips. And so they always want to go into town. And so they decide to go into town... And Mrs. and Mr. Bennett, because he wants Mr. Collins out of his library and away from him, says, "Yes, walk with my daughters into town. Get away from me for a while." And so they go, they all go to town together. And um, so basically, and, and so they they all walk into town. And when they first get into town, uh. They see uh, one of the officers, Mr. Denny, who Lydia has already mentioned and who Lydia probably kind of likes already. And uh, Kitty and Lydia see him with another person, somebody they don't know. And this is where we meet the infamous Mr. Wickham. Uh, Mr. Wickham, uh, Mr. Denny says that Mr. Wickham is a friend of, of Denny's. Uh, who had come from London, and he's going to join the regiment. And immediately, uh, Kitty and Lydia are are in raptures, because, oh, he's going to be wearing a red coat now, so of course he's going to be handsome and nice and good. Uh, but um, here's the, our first description of Mr. Wickham. His appearance was greatly in his favor. He had all the best parts of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing addressed. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice. So they've just met this good-looking guy. Uh, he's uh, he's handsome, and, he, and he's well-spoken, and, and he talks to other people easily, and so all of this is in his favor, and then here comes Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley in town, and Mr. Bingley says, oh, well, we were just coming to check on Jane to see how she was doing, and uh, Mr. Darcy just kind of bows and, you know, agrees with him, and all, and Elizabeth happens to notice something. She says, um, I say, okay, uh, Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, that is, to inquire after Jane, uh, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger, and Elizabeth, happening to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed color. One looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. So Elizabeth catches this little exchange between Mr. Wickham, who they have just met, and Mr. Darcy. Not only do they look at each other like they know each other, but both their faces changed color, and it's so clever, she says, one turned white and one turned red. And she doesn't tell you who turns what color. Now think about this. What, when somebody turns white, what feeling do you associate with somebody's face turning white? Fear, maybe? Shock? Okay. What color do we associate? What do we associate a face turning red with? Embarrassment or anger? So it could be either one at this point. 
and so one of them is guilty and one of them is an injured party, but we don't know who yet because she doesn't tell us which turned what color. There's a very clever little device that she uses here to give you an idea of the situation without giving it away. And I said, this is, it's a tiny little thing, but this is how good writers build suspense. This is how good writers plan a seed for a story. So, so we've got this exchange, and Mr. Darcy just barely acknowledges this guy. And he almost immediately rides off with Mr. Bingley. And so, Elizabeth's sitting here puzzling over this whole thing. Uh, when Miss, uh, and when they finally decide to go to Mrs. Phillips's house, and remember, Mrs. Phillips is uh, Mrs. Bennett's sister, or it, it's Mrs. Bennett's sister who's married to an attorney in town, and so they're seeing their aunt. Uh, and we get, we hear, we learn a little bit about Mrs. Phillips. Mrs. Phillips is a notorious gossip. Uh, she lives right in town, and she can see everything that goes on on the high street. And a real, a good little example of that is uh, she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home. That is Jane and Elizabeth, because she knew they were at Netherfield. Which, as their own carriage had not fetched, fetched them, she should have known nothing about it. If she had not happened to see Mr. Jones's shop boy in the street who had told her that they were not to send any more droughts to Netherfield because the Miss Bennets were come away. <laughs> so we learned that just by talking, mean, she, she talks to everybody in town trying to get little bits of news. And so she, she knows, she says she wouldn't have known about, and she's a little bit offended that she wouldn't have known that Elizabeth and Jane had come home from Netherfield if she hadn't asked the shop boy about it uh, and found out that they weren't sending medicine to Netherfield anymore. Uh, but in any case, she's a notorious, uh, a, a notorious gossip, and that's why Lydia and Kitty love to go see her because they're both notorious gossips too. Uh, but in any case, uh, they they introduce him to Mr. Collins, introduce her to Mrs. Mr. Collins. And Mr. Collins proceeds to apologize for showing up unannounced and, you know, all his civilities and, and apologies notwithstanding, Mrs. Phillips is, uh, is kind of impressed by it. You know, it's like, oh, well, he's so nice. And, and again, she's a little bit dim like her sister, doesn't see beyond it. Um, and, but she loses interest in Mr. Collins pretty quickly. Uh, and start say, and and they start talking about Mr. Wickham, and, and we find out that Mrs. Phillips had been watching Mr. Wickham and Mr. Denny from the, from the window the whole time. <laughs> she was watching everything go down from her window, and uh, and, and you know the, the, the Lydia and Kenny trying to ask her more questions about Mr. Wickham, but she only knows as much as they do that Ms. there was a, he was a friend of Denny's and that he'd come from London and he was going to take up a lieutenant ship in the Corps. Um, she said she had been watching him the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street. And had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the occupation. But unluckily, no one passed the windows now except a few of the officers, who in comparison with the stranger, that is Mr. Wickham, were become stupid, disagreeable fellows. And so now Mr. Wickham showed up and everybody else, nobody else is anywhere near as cool because of the novelty and because he's good looking. That's it. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so in any case, uh, Mrs. Phillips invites the girls uh, to come and have dinner with them. And she says, oh, well, we're going, I'm going to invite some of the officers too. And uh, so they decide to come and have dinner with Mrs. Phillips the next night. Um, and we get one last little dig at Mr. Collins, uh, and that Mr. Collins on his return highly gratified Mrs. Bennett by admiring Mrs. Phillips's manners and politeness. He protested that except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman, for she had not only received him with, most, with, with the utmost civility, 
but had even pointedly included him in her invitation for the next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something he supposed might be attributed to his connection with them, but yet he had never met with so much attention in the whole course of his life. So this guy is all superlatives and uh, and a nose up the butt. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, and that's the end of chapter. Uh, let me see, chapter fifteen, and that's probably a good stopping point. Uh, no. But. Again, just to just to kind of recap, um, Mr. Collins. What this uh, we we meet two fairly important two characters who are going to be pretty important later on in in these few chapters. The first of which is Mr. Collins, who, as I've said, is an idiot sycophant, and um, Mr. Wickham who is this dashing, good-looking, well-mannered fella, uh, who, by the way, does not like and is not liked by Mr. Darcy. And so we know how Elizabeth feels about Mr. Darcy. She doesn't like him, uh, even though we know, even though the reader knows that Mr. Darcy is attracted and likes Lizzie. Lizzie still doesn't like him. Uh, okay, uh, she's a, she's still convinced that he's this proud, disagreeable guy who's just looking down on her. And so her immediate thought, and so you know, given this, you can imagine what her first thought of this weird exchange between the two men is: is that oh well, Mr. Darcy did something wrong to this nice, uh, open character, you know, open. Uh, good-looking man because I know I don't like mr. Darcy but I think I might like this guy so mr. Darcy must have done something wrong and that's where the prejudice part comes in <laughs> uh, we, we know the pride part is mr. Darcy at this point and we know that the prejudice part is Ms. is Lizzie at some point but throughout the course of the novel you begin to understand that it's pride on both their parts and prejudice on both their parts. So whereas one is more is is one or the other, they're one or the other at the beginning. It kind of morphs into that both of them realizing that it's both for both of them. Um, so in any case, um, Lizzie's already made up her mind about Mr. Darcy, and she's kind of already made up her mind about Mr. Wickham, and this is extremely important. For later on uh, so just don't forget that and uh, just a quick uh, literary nerd thing here is the fact that we know that mr. Darcy is likes Lizzie but Lizzie doesn't that is dramatic irony mm -hmm. dramatic irony is where the reader knows but the characters don't it's like when you in, in a horror movie and you see the ghost, but the like behind the character, but the character hasn't seen the ghost yet. That's dramatic irony, and just remember that <laughs> because rain on your wedding day is not irony. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yes. pretty much it. And next time we'll start with chapter sixteen and and Mrs. Phillips's party. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Another excellent lesson. And I'll have this uh, edited and up on all the uh, traditional platforms and on the Noetic app as well. So, um, yeah, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.